Welcome everyone. Uh, <clears throat> you are at top 10 easy house plants to grow, um, which we are lucky enough today. Marlene Simon joining us um, from the Botanical Conservatory on the UC Davis campus. So if you haven't been there, it's the most fabulous place. It's a little wonder of a gem. And uh, post COVID, you should put that on your bucket list. In the meantime, um, I am Stacy Parker and I am with the UC Davis Arboretum and Public Garden. So I'm a fellow plant lover and, um, and I have been partnering with Healthy UC Davis and the staff and faculty health and well-being folks to partner on this Nature RX series that we're having today. And um, next week is our final session for um, for this stretch and you won't want to miss it. It's Japanese flower arranging and it's a really lovely and wonderful um, session with um, a professor emeritus from UC Davis. So um, I will be answering questions throughout. Um, I'll be monitoring the chat for Marlene, although we Marlene is a very popular um, speaker and we sometimes get so many <laughs> so many questions that we need to take a little break. So we'll, mo we'll be monitoring for that too. So um, does anybody have any questions before we get started? Oh, I think so, okay. And then what I wanted to do is start off by introducing Marlene. She is the staff horticulturist at the Botanical Conservatory, where she helps to care for their collection of around 4,000 plants. She's also known as the plant lady on Good Day Sacramento, where she answers viewers' questions. In addition, she writes for the Sacramento Bee and has her own podcast, Flower Power Garden Hour. So you all should um, definitely subscribe to that if you haven't already. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Marlene. Welcome and thank you. Thank you. So I am just going to get started and uh, start sharing the screen because, you know, I could talk forever <laughs> about plants. So let's see here, share. And we're going to start the slideshow from beginning. There we go. So, um, yeah, like I said, there's a lot to talk about. House plants are very in. I, you know, I think when you're immersed in the plant world your whole entire life, you sort of miss these trends. And all of a sudden, it's like people were asking about, you know, ficus laurata became this awesome house plant in, in Ernesto. My coworker and I joked because we had it in the conservatory and we're like, let's just get rid of this thing. Yeah, let's just throw it out here in the hallway. And then next thing we know, it's like people want it. And then same with Monstera deliciosa variegated plants are huge. So um, I love it. You know, we all know that house plants do wonders for us right now, of course, uh, during COVID, if you're stuck at home, they just add beauty, they add beauty all the time. They do cleanse the air, but, you know, NASA did a study back in the, I think the eighties that still, you know, some plants like the spider plant, sands of area, peace lily, they're able to pull out slightly more um, stuff, stuff from the air, but really, the true studies have shown you sort of have to almost live in a conservatory for it to really do uh, wonders. But of course they give us oxygen as well. Um, so I'm gonna, of course, we're gonna go through the top 10 easy house plants, ones that are difficult to kill. See, I see the 10 easiest house plants, i.e. if you kill plants, try these. With that said, I realized the picture I put on here has one of the hardest house plants to grow, which is this uh, jewel orchid, Macodes. But this right here is a pink petonia. It's pretty easy, but it's not on my list. Um, here's all my contact info, at Marlene the Plant Lady. Um, I realize I added an extra L there. Uh, that's all my social media, my email there. So we're gonna get started. I wanna start, of course, with tips. Um, and sorry, I to keep it short, keep myself on time, I decided to just to do sort of one screen and not lots of screens. And the, um, these I'm gonna go through pretty quick. But the first thing is use the correct soil for your watering, right? People always ask me, well, what kind of soil should I plant this in? Plants are really adaptable to the type of, type of soil. It's based on how much moisture they get. So do you love to water? 
Do you think you're helping your plants and you water every day? Or do you completely forget? So if you forget, you're most likely gonna wanna go with a potting soil that has more peat. Peat moss is great at holding moisture. It's incredibly difficult to wet. Um, that's why when you're potting up something, you always wanna put the soil in a secondary tub, slightly wet it first, then put it in your pot and then pot it up. Because if you've ever taken water and poured it over dry peat moss, or even just potting soil with a lot of peat moss, you get that, you know, the rays of the peat moss and it's hydrophobic. They say, you know, add a little drop of uh, dish soap to break that barrier, but just go ahead and mix it in a secondary tub and then wet it or then pot up. So if you tend not to water a lot, peat moss. If you overwater, love to water, go more on the succulent side. Uh, at the conservatory, we have a uh, many different waters, many of them are students, and we are on the side of someone's going to overwater plants. So we wanna make sure we'd rather water every day than have someone um, you know, water that plant heavy, but have planted it to assume it's only gonna get watered once every five days. So everything's planted in the succulent mix for us. And then our succulents are even more succulenty because we add more pumice and red lava. Um, so it really just depends on your water watering um, plans, basically. Um, another tip is when you go to pot, you know, you have to plant, and I'll just go to this one, a drain hole is a must, uh, except for a terrarium. It, a plant will survive. Like I see these succulents planted in these little tiny pots that don't have a drain hole in them. They need so little water that they're gonna survive for quite a while. But if you want it to live longer than just a while, then a drain hole is must because you need some place for that water to get out because it may not utilize it all. Um, and so what we do here at the conservatories, if we're using terracotta um, or plastic pot or a terracotta pot or ceramic pot with a big hole in the bottom, we'll take a, uh, you can see right here, a broken terracotta shard piece because we break a lot of pots <laughs> and it's slightly curved. So we'll put that over the hole or if you don't have that, the fabric weed cloth works well. If there's a plant that grows really fast, you could even use a paper towel or a coffee filter. And this will just prevent the soil from being pulled right out. You do want to avoid using like screen material because those holes are just big enough for sand to get stuck in the holes and plug it up. So the idea is you don't want the soil coming out, but you want the water to come out. So avoid um, screen type material, like, you, like what you use on windows. Okay, so here's, I give a talk on myths and this is one that I include in there. Do not use rocks in the bottom of the pot. It doesn't, and I have a, actually, this one's so important, I have a secondary slide down the road on it. Um, so people think, oh, I'm creating this area of aeration for my, my, my plant's roots. Well, where do plant roots wanna grow? They wanna grow in soil. They don't necessarily want to grow in just this air with rocks. So they may not grow down into that area. Uh, plus what's better at holding a uh, moisture? It's soil acts sort of as a, a sponge. So it's going to suck up the water. Um, so really it's, it's not needed. It's just going to reduce the amount of space for your roots. And keep plants away from heater vents. So I'm going to throw that in. It's, it's, it's winter you're turning the heater vent on, you have a plant that you just got this summer, and all of a sudden you're like, why is it dropping leaves? Why is it drying out? Well, that's hot, dry air blowing on your house plant. Similar too is right up against a window. You know, you put your hand on a, a window in winter, it can be quite chilly. So in the summer, you don't want plants right up against a south window because they could cook. And then also you may not want more sensitive plants right up against a window in the winter time because it could actually be cool. So just as the seasons change, the light's gonna change inside, the humidity's gonna change inside, the temperature is. So just sort of move plants around based on those slight different variations on, on um, you know, you're making yourself comfortable based on the seasons, make your plants comfortable based on the seasons. Okay, don't let plants sit in standing water for too long. So this is a method a lot of African violet growers use. Um, you know, you can either use the wicking method where it's just the piece of uh, yarn is the wick that pulls the moisture up. Um, I water my African violets just by pouring water in the saucers, but knowing that I'm going to empty those saucers if they don't pick up a good amount of moisture um, in a certain amount of time. The reason is, is that it could just cause too much anaerobic 
nest down at the base of that. And if the saucer's too big, get a turkey baster and siphon it out, right? If it's if you have a pot uh, with a saucer, you pour it in and you're like, uh-oh. If you have a cat, they might come over and drink it for you. <laughs> so, but, but you know, I don't recommend that. <laughs> the cats may disagree. Yeah. We have a question about what about African violet pots? Yes, so that's why I was saying the wiki method. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so ideally with an African violet pot, most of them, if, and, and there could be different types out there, have it where the, the pot sits above, but the wick comes down below. So the wick is sort of controlling how much moisture, but if you have a pot and you have it submerged that much in water, you know, it doesn't have the ability to wick when it's uh, running out of water. It basically, you're submerging it in water and you're, you're forcing it to have water in its soil when it's not ready to, if that makes sense. So yeah, the African violets, of course, your carnivorous plants, uh, but there's always exceptions, but it's just mainly when you water, water comes out the bottom. And that's my next one is you always want to water. So water comes out the bottom and then you just have the standing water for days. That's, you know, that could just grow a lot of bacteria. Uh, why do you want water to flow at the bottom of the pot? Same idea is you want those roots to take advantage of all that soil you put in there. You constantly just give it a little bit of water. The water's only going to go to, you know, a few inches down and the roots are like, huh, I'm going to stay here where there's water. Why am I going to go down there where it's dry? Or say you had roots going down because you were watering thoroughly and all of a sudden you just stop, those roots are going to dry out and die. So you want to make sure you water thoroughly so the soil is completely saturated. One method you can use is air bubbles coming out of the pot. If you water until no air bubbles are coming up, you know you've completely saturated that, that, uh, that root ball. And also, if you do water with um, like tap water, uh, it's going to flush salts out. So it's going to sort of secrete the salts out, which is, which is good, which you don't want those salts right up against the roots. So let's see. I have another question, Marlene. It's uh, how about the wandering Jew? I have one in a jar of water and it grows great, but have issues when it's in soil. Yeah, so there's always exceptions as people are pointing out right now, right? The lucky <laughs> bamboo, which is actually not bamboo, it's a dracaena, it's a terrestrial plant. You know, some people have more luck with them in, in moisture. Um, I would say with, um, it's a little hard to say. If, you're, if you have a plant, you're starting it in water, you're keeping it in water, you still wanna switch that water out because there is bacteria, it's, it's you know, you get that funky smell. Um, it could be the type of soil you're using mixed with how much you're watering it. Um, it could be that certain plants don't necessarily grow as well in a pot, like the uh, Tradescantias and a lot of plants, you know, they, they're meant to sort of root as they grow. Um, so it could be when you put it in a pot, you're noticing the center dying out because it's natural growth habitat. Um, so, but yeah, there's always exceptions. These are just sort of the overall broad rules, <laughs> if that makes sense. Okay, so reverse osmosis, RO, rainwater or distilled water is best if you have hard water or water softener. And in Davis, yes, we have hard water. It's better now that we get it mixed with Sacramento water. Um, I know where I live, I have a 90 foot deep well and it is incredibly hard and horrible. Um, my plants like die if they just even look at it, they're like, ah. <laughs> oh. Uh, but then again, parts of Sacramento, they could grow carnivorous plants who absolutely need perfect water. Um, so it really just depends where your water source is from. Um, and if you don't know, err on the side of caution and use you know, bottled water. Water softener is the same. If it is one of the salt-based water softeners, that is adding salt. And you're going to try, you want to avoid that because that could be harsh on plants. So you know, if you're getting rid of the hard water for your pipes and um, everything, then uh, still be cautious of your, your plants. Um, okay, pests are going to happen. There's no way of keeping pests out. They stick on you. You walk by a plant, you've got aphids on you. You go and you touch a plant, you just picked up a mealybug. They're going to come in on your shoes. There's no way you're not going to get pests. It's managing them, right? Um, certain pests, if you have, yeah, if you have, let's say, um, 
armored scale on your orchid, one orchid, you may want to get rid of that orchid. But if you have mealybugs, uh, spider mites, thrips, aphids, fungal gnats, it's just managing them because you are going to get those. Those are your most common uh, houseplant problems. And so, you know, rubbing alcohol is great. Dilute it. Um, sometimes I don't dilute it. <laughs> sometimes I just take it and spray, right? Uh, don't use it too much because it can desiccate leaves. I wouldn't use it on your African violets or any leaves that have hairs on it. Uh, you can make your own soap spray with Dawn dish soap or neem oil, but the key is to do it more than once because you're trying to get, you need to keep up with all the different uh, sort of uh, uh, stages of life. So you may get the adults, but then there's the eggs hidden in there. Remember these bugs, they don't, they're hiding in the little crevices. So you're gonna have to like, if you have an orchid, you might wanna pull the, the, the brown sheath around the leaf and you're like, haha, there you are, you know? So you could use either the Q-tip on some of them, spray them down. Um, even a hose blast, but I don't recommend taking them outside this time of year um, into the cold and then taking a, a, a cold hose and water and blasting them, right? That's going to do more damage than just a few pests. Uh, now, spider mites are a problem because they're more difficult to get rid of. Um, plumerias are a notorious magnet for spider mites. Prayer plants, marantas are notorious for spider mites. You may notice those with all the cobwebbing on them. If it gets to the cobweb section, you've let it go pretty far. So uh, you're really gonna have to wipe them down. But I've even used like dusting sulfur with those, but bring it outside. You don't wanna breathe uh, dusting sulfur in. So you will get pests and, you know, I can't go into them anymore here, but, uh, I would love to. I love, I do the IPM here. So we have pests and we have, we have the ability to cultivate uh, predatory insects like predatory wasps, predatory mites. So I actually want certain amount of pests in the greenhouse because if I kill off all the mealybugs, um, I'm going to kill off the, the parasitic wasps that control them. So it's a balance here at the conservatory. Yeah, most people, you don't need that balance. Um, but you'd be surprised, you may pick up some aphid predators out there. So if you see an aphid that has a brown swollen body and it's not moving, it's probably been parasitized. Um, so you probably don't wanna brush off your plant. Um, okay, so where do you plant, put your plants um, inside? Ideally an east or a south window. During the summer, that south window might get very hot. So you're going to want to move it away a few feet. I have some people who are like, yeah, I have my plant by a south window and I don't know why it's just not doing well. Well, it turns out they have a giant tree outside and they keep their blinds closed. So in effect, it's not really south exposure. Uh, east is good too, because you get that morning sun, which isn't as intense. Um, and you know, then if you have a situation that's ideal and you have windows on multiple sides, then that's, that's great. It might even get enough light to come in where your plants can be more in the center of the house. But generally most people put them a few feet away from a, from a window. A lot of people wanna grow them in bathrooms. I recommend having a window in your bathroom, but even then, if it's a little small one up there, you're gonna need to do supplemental light. And uh, see, hopefully everyone can see that. LEDs are incredibly cheap and you could even buy um, LED full spectrum, right? Full spectrum, plant spectrums like an ACE that are bulbs that you just take your, your standard LED out or fluorescent and plug into your regular lamp. Most inexpensive LED lights, if you look them up, um, they're relatively cheap, but they have to go pretty close to your, your plant. Um, to get the full maximum. So they'll say like, oh, for full amount of, uh, you know, foot candles be two feet away. So if you have just a cluster of plants, you could buy a strip light for like $40. I think I bought a pack of eight strip lights um, for like $50. And yeah, they have to go a little bit closer to your plant uh, instead of just like hanging up on the ceiling. Um, but it's worth it. So don't be afraid if you have to go that route and buy a grow light because they're really cheap. But do look, because a lot of LEDs still have that purple glow to them. So you want to make sure that it's a, a clear LED with full spectrum. So if you want to grow in your bathroom or in the winter, remember there's less sun in the winter time. So it may be something you even use just for the winter time to keep your plants going. 
Okay, correct pot size. Um, I see this one a lot where people have a plant and they want to repot it. Then they go really big. So certain plants can handle that just fine. But if you're, when in doubt, only move up a few inches. Because what happens is you're taking the, the roots that are yay big and you're putting them in a pot with soil yay big. There's not enough roots to act like a sponge to pick up the moisture that you're, you're filling in all that soil. So that soil is going to sit there being wet. And what happens when you have a wet uh, environment is bad things could grow and that could lead to rot. Uh, so you really want to move up into a pot size that you know those roots are going to quickly grow into, you know, not so you have to repot it in like three months, but you know, maybe a year or two years and it's going to be able to absorb all that moisture. So uh, another thing that happens sometimes, and we're not really sure why, but I, I know this does happen. You get a big pot and it seems like the top isn't growing and uh, you put it in a big pot. A lot of times it's trying to set down some more roots and then all of a sudden the top will grow. And I don't know if any of you were at my last talk about uh, propagation, but when we move our house plants, we um, transplant our house plants, we prune back first, wait for new growth to occur, then move it out of its pot. And the reason for that is the hormone responsible for root formation is formed in the, the new growth. So if you were to prune a plant back and disturb its roots, what you're doing is putting it sort of in this no grow situation. The hormone responsible for green growth forms in the roots. So if you disturb the roots and disturb the top at the same time, you're not having top growth and you're not having root growth. So if you can cut the plant, prune the plant back to the size you want, wait for growth and then transplant it so it could get those roots set and then it could grow uh, top growth. So hopefully that made sense. But of course, you know, like if you have a, a you know, Tradescantia or a spider plant, they don't care. They're like, well, we don't care. Um, okay, so this is why I'm saying about use the correct pot size. Um, so this is the corn, the stem of the Titan arum. And you could see how uh, uh, wide but squat it is. And it doesn't have a lot of roots. So what we do in this case is when you have a really wide uh, sort of body of growth, but it's not very deep and it's hard to find a pot, you can take a, uh, a pot and invert it into the pot. And then we put the corm on top of it. So if you have a deep container and you know the plant's not gonna grow that much, you could put um, broken terracotta pot shards, uh, pots, uh, even packaging peanuts, not the kind that dissolve, to sort of fill that space in so you don't have the, the soil. This works really well for outdoor containers, maybe not so much for, for your house plants, but it is something that we do because it's hard to find a short squat pot. Um, sad story though, we did use a plastic pot and they don't make plastic pots like they used to apparently. So we were wondering why the corn was so far down into our soil. We went to go transplant it. The bottom of the pot it was sitting on broke and the corn over time started shrinking, shrinking, shrinking into it. So make sure it's a good sturdy pot. It was sad. We're like, oh, we lost some uh, weight from the corn. I think it went from 40 pounds down to 35 pounds. I wish I could lose some weight just by sitting on a pot. <laughs> Seems to be the opposite. <laughs> all right. Okay, so almost all plants prefer acidic conditions. And as you know, that's a, a pH level of seven or less. You know, 6.5 is ideal. Some don't care. Roses don't seem to care. Um, some house plants don't care. But ideally, that's where most of the nutrients are available uh, to the plant. And so it can be difficult keeping that acidic condition when you have, you know, most potting soil you get is going to be acidic already because it has peat and peat is acidic. Um, and if you water with tap water or you add fertilizer, you're slowly eking that up to a alkaline situation and soon the plants may not be that happy. So yes, you could transplant it. You could even add soil sulfur on top, sprinkle it in that's slow acting to uh, drop the pH or you could go and add a little bit of vinegar. And I have right here, it's one to two tablespoons per gallon of water. 
But I recommend getting a pH test. You can buy those little pH testers at uh, the hardware store. I wouldn't worry about the nitrogen testers and everything like that. If you have new potting soil, it's gonna have nitrogen. You start fertilizing, it's gonna have nitrogen. Uh, but do it before and after so you could sort of pinpoint. You don't wanna just keep doing this every day going, wow, it's, it's an eight. I'm just gonna, every day, I'm gonna give my plant some you know, vinegar. You don't want to do that. So do it sparingly. But this is one way of uh, dropping the pH to make your plants happier. That and, of course, moving it out of the, uh, the old potting soil. All right, let's see here. Okay, the number one question I get constantly is uh, burnt leaf edges. So this plant did not make it on the list of easy plants to grow. This is a prayer plant, Maranta. Um, they're high humidity loving plants, right? So certain plants tolerate our indoor humidity levels. Other plants like Maranta need it more humid or their leaf edges will burn. If you used uh, Davis tap water, have hard water, one of the first signs of that is these leaf edges burning. Remember, older leaves, lower leaves are going to age and yellow, right? And if you have a plant that has you leaves, but they're bigger, you're going to notice that more. So, you know, Marianta, your plant Marianta may have seven leaves. So, of course, you're going to notice that it has brown. Um, so, those are some of the reasons. When they're older, the, the cells are just dying and the water's just not getting to the edge. If you're not watering enough, there isn't enough water getting to the edge. If you have salts, the salts can be burning up some of the roots that isn't allowing the water to come to the edge and then humidity. You can take a pair of little scissors and cut it because this is a completely good viable leaf but you could just trim them around we have students that were like here go ahead and trim around if you get a spot like this that that might be more bacterial spot and that could be over watering so sometimes bacterial leaf spot and burnt leaf edges can almost look very similar but bacterial leaf spot tends to go into the sort of the center of the leaf more so really when you have a, a burnt leaf edge Look at the plant. Is it notorious for it? Look at your humidity. Is it the right plant for that amount of humidity? Is it a lower, older leaf? Did you just give it some fertilizer too much? Is the soil too wet? Remember, when you overwater your plants, it mimics underwatering because you're rotting out roots and they could actually even wilt and mimic the same symptoms of, of overwatering. On orchids, that's just, as soon as you start getting wrinkled leaves on an orchid, it's really hard to say, did you overwater or did you underwater it? Because it's you're rotted out or killed off roots and it's the same um, symptoms. So that's the number one question right there that I get. So hopefully that helped. There's no magic answer. I say use bottled water, uh, try to increase humidity with a humidifier. Spraying your plants doesn't help. That's just a quick, you know, even when it's hot and you spray yourself, how long does that last? Very short. The gravel beds, you can get a tray and put some gravel on it, but even then that's not really creating a great humidity, but humidifiers are pretty cheap if you're, if you want to go that route. All right, so how often should you water house plants? That's another question that I get a lot. Well, it depends on the type of plant, light intensity, temperature, air circulation, container mix, health of plant, and is there a dormancy period? So we'll start with the bottom one, is there a dormancy period? So if you're growing South African plants with a cadix, a swollen base like a, a, a desert rose, um, if it starts dropping leaves, or here's another one, plumeria. Say you bring your plumerias in for the winter time, they start dropping leaves. Cut the watering back a lot. They're pretty succulent. They have less leaves, they're going dormant. They're not photosynthesizing. They don't need that moisture. So cut it back health of the plant. So if it's looking sad, and this sort of goes along with the amount of moisture too, and the soil's wet, don't think you're helping it by giving it more water, right? Uh, container mix, that's what I started off with because that will let you know if you need to water more. A um, uh, uh, soil with more pumice, sand, red lava, uh, perlite, you're gonna most likely need to water more often. Uh, air circulation, if it's a stagnant area, um, remember, wind is great for plants because it, it, it moves um, air moisture around, prevents pests and diseases, but it can also, you know, help to dry plants out a little bit. Temperature, of course, light intensity, 
And then of course the type of plant. If you have a succulent inside, you know you probably don't need to water it so much. Uh, types of plants. So just going into the succulents, let dry completely to mostly between water. And if you're growing a succulent inside, you probably get away watering it every two weeks, for sure. You know, uh, leafy plants let dry mostly to some. And when I mean that is, you know, your fingers are great way of figuring out. If you can get into that soil, you want the top several inches to be dry of soil before you water again. If you dig down and you're an eighth of an inch down and it's moist, almost no plant needs to be watered then. And orchids keep bark partially humid by soaking. You know, you don't just want to pour the water over. Uh, that ice cube method. So it sounds harsh. One, it sounds silly, it's a marketing gimmick. And then it sounds harsh. You're putting these frozen ice cubes on a tropical plant that wants warmth. And then you're putting them right there on the root. So it could hurt those roots. But if you put it on the bark, in theory, it, it actually does work. So, um, okay, our mix. And I'm gonna look at the time. Okay, our time, our type of soil that we use. This is what we've made. And we get it at C.L. Smith up in woodland and they now make their potting soil almost like ours with a few exceptions so this is what we consider our succulent mix but we use it on almost every single leafy plant except for carnivorous plants and orchids and a few other exceptions so it is um three parts five sixteenth red lava or you could use a quarter inch pumice right that's that hard white rock then we do one part uniform coarse sand, right? Don't go out into the uh, sandbox and pull that sand because that's not going to be coarse enough and a cat might have done its business in there and uh, you don't want to use that. And then one part peat moss or coconut peat, right? Because peat moss, um, you know, coconut's more sustainable. Peat moss is still, I think, easier to find at uh, nurseries. And then one part redwood compost or super soil. Now, super soil used to be like this. Don't think anyone works for super soil who's listening to this. <laughs> super soil used to be like the best soil. And now you want where you could use it as redwood compost because that's pretty much what it is. Um, and then per yard, we add three pounds of oyster lime, dolomite 65, and sing single super phosphate. But you know, if you fertilize, you don't necessarily need to add that. You could buy some oyster shell. Um, on a box. Um, so this is the mix that is ideal for us at the conservatory. My house plants at home, I will use the CL Smith mix, which is very similar to this, and I will add extra peat moss. Why? Because I'm lazy and I don't want to water as much and I'm the only one watering, so I don't have to worry about people over watering. So I'm adding peat moss to hold more moisture and then versus letting the soil drain out. If you have a three bags of say, uh, you know, a, a pretty cheap brand of potting soil, not even a cheap brand, some of these expensive brands are pretty crappy, I must say, you could go ahead and buy bags of pumice or red lava and sand and add into the cheaper uh, or existing potting soil you have and mix that in to create the aeration. So, you know, there's multiple ways of achieving um, a, a better potting soil, right? Um, you know, there's, and then there's sort of like, you know, there's African violet mixes. African violet mixes are, are literally just peat moss and perlite. And if you water your African violets uh, not that much, that's fine. Uh, if you overwater your African violets, move it to this, this mix. Um, or something with a little bit more aeration in it, so you're not rotting them, rotting them out. And can you really me? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. We, we had a question: um, Is Miracle Grow not good? So, you know, I will say it's been a while since I bought some Miracle Grow uh, soil. It's been a while since I've bought any bag potting soil. I like EB Stone. Uh, Miracle Grow, their whole basis is they have a starter fertilizer in there. So, you know, you don't have to fertilize grow. That's the other thing. Some of these soils have a lot of fertilizer in them right away. So you don't want to start. What I recommend to people is if you know you want something that's going to drain a little bit better, feel the bag. 
you should be able to feel pumice and uh, either red lava or something that's going to help aeration in it. If you feel a bag and it's just soft and gushy, it's probably going to be more redwood compost or just more peat moss. So um, I'm not saying it's bad. I'm saying it's expensive for what it is, and it may not be right for you. About that. I think that was pretty diplomatic of me, actually. <laughs> So yeah, it's not bad. It's, uh, you know, super soil, sadly, it's gone downhill. Even Kellogg's, I wasn't too happy with Kellogg's. It's really just redwood compost. So I always feel the bag. And then there's some that are like Fox Farms is incredibly expensive, but that stuff has, you look at the ingredients, I'm like, do I need all this? Well, sure, of course, but, <laughs> but it, has, it has a good balance of, uh, of aeration and water holding capabilities. I mean, that's what we're aiming for, aeration and something to hold moisture. You could add the fertilizer, you know, as you fertilize your plants. So, um, oh, so this one I just threw here of um, why you don't wanna add rocks in the bottom of your pot. So right here's the, the soil saturation zone right here. You add rocks, you've just moved your saturation zone up to there. Look how close that is to basically the top of your plant, how few roots. And then you have more rocks because you know more must be better, right? You got more here and you've moved that up. So the roots are literally gonna grow right here and that area is gonna be really uh, wet, right? It's not necessarily helping drainage, right? It's still gonna hold moisture. So this is why you don't wanna add anything to the bottom of your pot except for something covering um, the hole. This is a myth, we must help debunk this. If you see someone planting, they put rocks in the bottom of their pot, take their pot and just dump them out. Just do that and then walk away. You don't even need to like explain. Um, I was just gonna show you before we started plants. This is my new studio. I do, um, I, I'm not allowed in the Good Day studio anymore. And I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna turn this area and, and uh, turn it into a studio. So I set my little camera up right here. So these are my plants. I am uh, going to get a humidifier. And how you know you may need a humidifier is the tips of things start dying off, right? Like, um, you know, like, like this aeroid right here is perfectly fine. This begonia is perfectly fine. Uh, but then when you have certain vines and you notice the tips start growing and then the tips start dying, that's usually a humidity issue. So I'm going to get a, not a plant humidifier, but a one that people use and put it just right around here so it can humidify the plants. I do have little, I do have LED grow lights, strips all along here. They're actually shooting the, um, up there. I have a metal halide, uh, 500 watt, 600 watt, um, but man, it, it, it creates a, a hefty bill. <laughs> so it's a balance of, uh, do I pay for the initial LED price for a, one that really works. We just replaced all of our lights in the main conservatory um, and with these beautiful LED lights and you know they're nice and clean light, but they're 1200 each, but it's worth it. Okay, so if you have cats or you don't want, or you have kids who like to dig, this is a coffee table, a, a display case that I got. I chopped the legs down, sealed it all inside and I created a coffee table terrarium. I've only watered it twice and I've had it two years. So that's the idea. And the soil that I use for this is uh, peat moss, perlite, and sand. That's what we use for our carnivorous plant. So something that you want to hold moisture, uh, peat moss, perlite, a little bit of sand in there. So we're gonna go through, um, I got what I got, 20 minutes, 20 minutes, right? Think I got? No, 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 you have until one. I have until only one. Okay, I thought it ended at one ten. Well, I think that that's how that 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 yeah. invite okay. you, but it technically till one. I think I could do it one. Okay, so easy to grow house plants. I'm sure some of you are going to disagree, especially if you kill them. But so, and up here, if it has a little kitty cat and a doggy, it means it's safe for doggies and kitties. So in case I forget. Uh, doesn't mean you want them eating your plants, but African violets, relatively easy to grow for what they give you. They could be in constant bloom. Now, what I've experienced is the more light, the better. 
a south window is ideal. You may get some burnt leaves, but hey, if you get these flowers, oh well, if there's a burnt leaf or two. You could do multiple ways of watering, lift their leaves up and pour water, or just sit them in a, you know, a tray of water. Hopefully they take it up and you could drain that tray, or you could buy the African violet wicking ones. You could grow them in an African violet soil, or you could grow them in a succulent, depending on how you water them. But they do need higher light than most people think to get them to bloom. They will get mealybugs. So you really have to be aware that you'll get mealybugs right into there. If they rot out, you most likely overwatered them. All right, ficus, deltoidea. So this is the one ficus I have on the list. Um, ficus lorata, the fiddle leaf fig, I get so many questions about that because it gets bacterial leaf blight. The leaves drop if the humidity is not good. This ficus gets about, for us, I would say most at max three feet three feet wide. This one we didn't prune and you can see how thick it gets. This one, it's fun. You can practice your bonsai skills without actually having a bonsai. Um, it, it is so fuss free. Uh, it doesn't have a kitty and a doggy because it, it does have um, some toxins. And all the plants that I have in here, lilies by far are the most toxic plant to a cat. I do not have any in my yard or inside. Even a little bit of pollen could kill your cat outright. All these house plants that I have can make your cat sick, uh, vomiting and throw, throwing up, except for the ones that I have the, the kitty on. Uh, so, you know, if your cat eats the spicus, you may notice it throwing up. But beyond that, it probably wouldn't do much more damage than that. Uh, ficus, low water, loves to be pot bound can be pot bound. You don't need to worry about transplanting this at all. Medium amount of water. And what I mean by that is it doesn't want to go weeks without water. Probably water it maybe twice, twice a week inside to once a week if it's in the winter time. So really right now you're probably only needing to water your house plants once a week um, in the winter. And then in the summer, if it's a moderate plant, maybe twice a week. So remember those vary greatly. Uh, Sands of area, also known as mother-in-law's tongue. Now, I thought this was indestructible. We gave one to the chancellor, I'm not blaming the chancellor. I'm blaming whoever, I'm not even blaming the person who takes care of the plants in case they're here. It died, <laughs> somehow it died. So uh, low light or high light, it doesn't seem to care. Low, low water. You could go probably three weeks without watering this plant and it probably wouldn't care. It could be incredibly pot bound. It could burst out of its pot and it's like, eh, I don't care. Uh, however, they do have saponoids, saponids in it. So, you know, you don't want your cat to eat it, but I don't think a cat or a dog, maybe a dog would really chew on this anyways, but um, nice structural form upright. There's various sizes. These things here are about three, four feet. Um, the previous one I show you is the most common one. They're um, pretty popular now. Uh, you could do even uh, start them by leaf cuttings as well. So you can take portions of the leaf and root them in pumice and they'll, and they'll grow. They do have flowers. Most people aren't aware, but it has to be pretty high light for them to flower. They'll tolerate low light, but for to get flowers, it has to be higher light. All right, so I don't have all begonias. I have just cane, what are considered cane begonias, also known a lot of times as the angel winged begonias, avoid Rex begonias. They're not gonna be too happy inside your, inside your house. Um, they're more problematic. But if you see one with long canes, that's how it gets its name, um, then, then go for it. This one here is Begonia argentio guttata, and we propagate this at the conservatory. It's incredibly easy to grow inside. We actually, you could grow it outside too, it just will die down and come back if it's exposed to cold. Um, sometimes with too low of light, they get stretched out, but if you just cut them back, they're fine. Beautiful foliage. The more light you have, you'll get clusters of flowers almost year round. Now, the thing with begonias is they have uh, oxalic acid. It's the same thing that's in the um, oxalis, the, the, what you call the um, uh, sour grass, which isn't a grass. Uh, it's the weed right now with the yellow flowers. You chew on it and you get that, ooh, tang. You could actually eat the, the, the flowers of this, 
but if a cat were to eat it, it's not good or a, a dog. And um, so really you have to know, I mean, I had tons of plants in my previous house and my cats were like, I don't care. This round of cats I have, they're crazy. They're crazy little things. Uh, so this Begonia Argentio Guttata and another cane Begonia, this is my studio, is uh, Sophie Cecile. And this one has just been growing so fast. And uh, notice I still have it in it. Uh, number one, something else I should mention is um, always transplant as soon as you get one, a, a plant into your own potting soil. The potting soil that uh, plants are shipped in is cheap and it tends to hold too much water right? Because they're shipping it and it tends to be just the peat or the redwood, uh, which is okay if you water accordingly. But if you're used to watering less um, or more, I should say, then you run the risk of killing your plant outright. So it's always a good practice to just take it out of the pot and uh, uh, move it into your potting soil as soon as you get it. That's what we do here at the conservatory. Uh, so this one's a great one too, but any of the cane begonias for the most part are really good. Okay, I don't know if anyone recognizes this. This is the plant biology office. <laughs> so look at that. Isn't that amazing? So everyone knows the pothos and the pothos epiprenum is super easy to grow. This one's similar, it's an aeroid, Syndapsis pictus. And I don't know if it has, it might be called velvet leaf, but Syndapsis, no, again, no cat, no dog. Um, the reason is, is all aeroids have those uh, calcium oxalates in it, um, these rapids that all, are almost like little glass shards. If you've ever had a monstera fruit and you've got, oh, that hurts, that's those, those rapids. So they are in the, in the leaves. So, but you can see here how pretty it gets. Low water, uh, climbs up the wall, but won't necessarily have to. They're just allowing it. You can have it trail down. This is the foliage closer up. It has this nice silvery foliage, sort of a velvet texture to it. You could just make cuttings all day long, start them in water, uh, super easy plant to grow. Uh, remember with these trailing plants, you are gonna lose some leaves at the center here. That's just normal. You, know, you could always cut it back or loop the plant around. Okay, sorry for the bad picture, but ours here, and of course, when you want a picture, you can't find one, but you see these all the time is the uh, Dracaena marginata. This is the one with those thin leaves, uh, multi-trunks. They could get upwards, you know, 12 feet tall, but they take a while. And uh, super easy, low, low water. Be careful when you get them. A lot of times they stick multiple cuttings in. So if you have one dye, um, it, it's actually not the whole plant. A lot of times it's probably just that one cutting. I'm gonna speed up a little bit more here. Dracaena fragrance, the corn plant, notorious for brown tips. Just have a pair of scissors handy. Doesn't mean your plant's unhealthy. It's just the way it is. Maybe switch up the water. So um, Dracaena fragrance, that's also known as the corn plant. And I'm not using common names here because if you go and ask for a corn plant, what are you gonna get? All right, Hoyas, uh, Hoya carnosa. So these are the wax flowers, not all Hoyas. Hoya carnosa is a super easy one. They're trailing with more light, you'll get flowers. If you don't put them in bright enough light, they won't flower, but they'll be beautiful foliage. So once again, blast it with a south window, ideally. Uh, Hoya pubicalix is another one. And this one is safe for dogs and cats, supposedly. Um, and I say that because it's in the Sclupidaceae, which I thought was moved to you. Anyways, according to the AS. PCA, which is a great website, ASPCA, if you just Google toxic plants, there's a whole list for cats and dogs. So Hoya pubicalix, look at the fuzzy, so cute, blooms a lot. One of the few Hoyas that blooms a lot in your house. Look at the various flowers and Hoyas, so pretty. Uh, Diphenbachia, super easy to grow. One of the most, uh, I would say toxic, with that said, before I knew what I was doing, growing plants and would just grow plants, I had a cat who would chew this and I thought, oh, it's like grass. It's chewing it and throwing up. Turns out tons of calcium oxalates. I'm hoping I didn't shorten the kitty's lifespan, but it would chew it and throw it up. No doctor visits were necessary. Uh, this plant can get as tall as your ceiling, but it will be very spindly. All you need to do is cut it down. Medium light, low water, could be pot bound. Uh, super, but it's pretty. That's an easy, easy plant to grow. It's known as Diphenbachia. 
so, okay, so I'm almost done here. If you wanna grow succulents inside, please do not grow sedums or echeverias or ones that really need more light than inside can handle. If you want succulents inside, do holorthias. Holorthias are this uh, genus that has so many different forms on it, safe for dogs and cats. Look at this one, Holorthia cooperi, so cute. And they don't get very big. Grow them in a succulent mix, south or east window, water every 10 days of that. Look at that, Holorthia acuminata. I mean, look how different that looks from the other one, but they only get a few inches tall. The flowers are in insignificant, really. And then look at this one, Holorthia truncata. I mean, look how cute that is. I mean, so really the best succulents for inside, along a windowsill, um, small space. And then, okay, last one. The number one easiest plant to grow is the mm. easy, easy Zamiacolcus zamiafolia. This is as, almost as big as they get. These are big monsters, but they take a while to get to this size. I had a small one. It was, I had a south window and I had an east window. I went six months without watering it and it didn't care. I mean, I'm sure it was cussing me out inside, but it supposedly didn't care. So very low water, low light. If you have dorms, great for dorms. So it takes high light, it takes low light, it takes low water. You can even do high water, just don't put it outside where it's cold. And because it is an aeroid, it, it does have the calcium oxalate. So it is uh, considered toxic once again for dogs and cats. And with that said, beetle go and I thank you. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you so yeah. much. For I think we should let people go, but we did have a couple of questions that came in. So if you have a minute and can stay after. Okay, so how do you remove the pups off a of bromelia? Do you just remove and replant in another pot? Yeah, so um, usually you can find the little stem where they're attached to. If you could peel back all the foliage and, and they're still a, and they're big enough where there's a, a, a stem below the leaves, cut that and then stick that in um, whatever you're growing them in, but we usually root them in a pumice. Um, you could even do like sphagnum. Really, it's based on your water. They're epiphytic, so really they don't need to be in soil. They just need to be in something that's going to have moisture. Um, you could sometimes even twist them off, do a nice twist, and you'll get the base. But I would really ideally cut them. Remember, the mother plant dies on bromeliads after they flower, so that's great that you got pups because that's how they keep growing. Okay, so thank you. Do you have any suggestions for a good tree type plant that will do well with a small east facing window? Um, yes, I would say the Polycius, P-O-L-Y-S-C-I-A-S, Fruticosa. It's uh, one of, it's sort of like the China doll plant. Um, let's see what else the, uh, I mean, ficus benjamina still does good. Just remember when the leaves drop, don't move it. It's just putting on new new leaves, right? Um, and uh, trying to think of others, but those are the uh, coffee. You can even grow coffee. You might not get flowers, but coffee is a pretty common, easy to grow house plant. Uh, use mm. bottled water. So. Yeah. Okay, one last question here. We had lots of thank yous. I think people are having to peel off. I have a wonderful collection of plants at the school facing south, but I will be away for 10 days later this month. How can I keep them watered while I'm away? Well, I think 10 days, you're probably okay. If you give them a heavy, heavy soak, maybe that's where you keep a little bit of water in the, in the, in the saucer and air on side of caution. 10 days, turn your heater off, you should be okay. Yeah. And one last one. This is the last one. Where do you recommend buying plants? Oh, oh goodness. That's wherever. So Logies online, L-O-G-E-E-S online is great. Um, you know, uh, Fairfield, no, is it not Fairfield? Fair Oaks Nursery has a really good uh, plant selection, Green Acres. You know, there's four of them. Some of them are a little bit better. I think the one on Florida Perkins has uh, good house plants. Um, a lot of people, if they want specific stuff, are looking online. You know, the prices of certain house plants are just insane. Uh, and then, like, you could randomly find great begonias, like at Trader Joe's. But those are the those are the ones I would try. 
And um, sometimes the Botanical Conservatory also has uh, plants for yeah. sale as yeah. well. When so COVID support. is not a thing anymore, we are, our, our plants are going to be nice sizes, but we'll still keep the prices down because we want them out of here. But yeah, we do resell with the Arboretum at the very end of the, of the, the, the teaching nursery. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you again. We're getting lots of uh, praise and thank yous. Good. And once again, Marlene, it's always awesome and it's always a pleasure. And I always learn so much. Good. So thank you so Good. much. All right. Okay, everybody. Thank you.